Tuesday, March 1st. Time to plan for your party yesterday morning is update. Government is being urged to fast track the reform of state owned enterprises as its International Monetary Fund backed Barbados Economic Recovery and Transformation Program faces a series of challenges. It's coming from the Boat Monitoring Committee. In its latest report, the committee identified key risks to the program meeting the criteria and structural benchmarks set by the IMF under its extended fund facility. The continued severity of the impact of COVID-19, the continuing challenges with supply chain logistics globally, and further increasing oil prices coupled with limited GDP growth opportunities are the principal risks to the program. That was co-chair of the committee and the chairman of the Barbados Private Sector Association, Tricia Tanis. She said given that government's spending had increased significantly over the past year due to its response to triple shocks, it was more important now than ever that the expected reforms to the state-owned enterprises make progress. The financial support to SOEs continues to rise steadily reaching $416 million for the first three fiscal quarters of 2021-2022 versus $366 million and $392 million in the same period for the prior two years. As the IMF have noted in their December 2021 staff report, the majority of state-owned enterprises continue to struggle with structurally weak profitability and high operating costs that give rise to transfer dependence and highlight a need for sustained reform. The BERT Monitoring Committee notes that a financial health dashboard for state-owned enterprises was developed under the EFF to provide the government of Barbados with a mechanism to analyze the performance of priority state-owned enterprises and further elaborates targeted reform measures to reduce government dependence. The BERT Monitoring Committee encourages the government of Barbados to ensure that effective use is made of this tool and reforms of these entities are accelerated as a matter of extreme urgency. Stakeholders react to proposals for a revamped grant government and for the morning. Over the weekend, Prime Minister Mia Motley announced that crop over would be staged for the first time since 2019, with grant government and for the morning to be decentralized through at least eight venues. President of the Entertainment Association of Barbados, Rudy Maloney, said that the suggestion to hold two events at multiple locations was put forward in 2020. This is something that we were asking for for the longest time, so it has now become a, re uh, a reality. It's, that's a good, a, a, a good, a good start. Um, I do see all the other Caribbean islands uh, have not uh, their carnivals or mass or whatever, whatever they're doing. Um, so I don't see Barbados should, should be any different. Actually, I, I see this as an opportunity to, to, for Barbados to have the, if not the best, one of the best um, products um, coming, out, coming out of the Caribbean. Meanwhile, veteran band leader Chetwin Stewart believes while the four-day morning event could be split up, Grand Cadument, he said, would be negatively affected by such a move. Government's decision to switch to electric buses at the transport board has already resulted in millions of dollars of savings. That's according to the chief executive officer of the transport board, Fabian Wharton. 
Speaking before the Standing Finance Committee in Parliament on Monday, he disclosed that the state-owned enterprise had significantly reduced the amount of money spent on bus maintenance. Of course, when you purchase new buses, you will immediately gain savings on your bus maintenance. And, and, that is, and that is one of the key cost drivers of the transport board. And I'll give an example. Um, in, at the end of March 2019, we had $15 million in bus maintenance. At the end of 2020, we were looking at $12 million. At the end of 2021, $6 million. Uh, so when you look at it, it's a downward trend as it radiates to the bus purchase. So the government's investment, that capital investment into those new vehicles, um, has really borne fruit first in the bus maintenance. Wharton disclosed that the transport board's fuel costs had also decreased. When we look at financial year 2020, we are talking about $8.2 million in diesel. When you combine um, financial year 2021, you are talking about just about $5.6 million when you combine the diesel fleet and the electric fleet to give you that what our total fuel costs would have been. A year to date, up to the end of February, we are talking about $4.9 million. So you can see the savings. And it must bear in mind that given that we were going through the pandemic and the protocols that were in place, the size of that fleet, um, that diesel fleet, was a bit larger than we had anticipated and budgeted for because we were moving to reduce the size of that fleet so that we can gain those, those um, savings on, on diesel and therefore reduce our fuel bill. And, and that was principally because the, the diesel buses, the older diesel buses, had a, have a, a larger capacity. And given that we were at 75% and at 1.60%, um, we needed to be able to move the traveling public, public within those restrictions, so we had to maintain those buses a bit longer. Prime Minister Mia Motley and other regional leaders are in Belize for CARICOM's 33rd Intersessional Summit. The two-day meeting, which begins today, is the first in-person meeting of CARICOM leaders since the COVID-19 pandemic. According to CARICOM Secretary General Dr. Carla Barnett, leaders will discuss, among other things, a draft protocol aimed at pushing forward the further implementation of aspects of the CARICOM single market and economy, the situation in Haiti, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, and the ongoing situation in Ukraine. Family and friends of Jamal Quinton are trying to come to grips with his sudden death. The Bell St. Michael resident was recorded as the island's fifth road fatality for the year after he was involved in an accident on Sunday. Jamal's sister, who declined to give her name, said she was sad and confused about other developments. All I know is that he went to bloody motorcycle and on his way back home, he, he died. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know because I hear a lot of stories. I don't know if he hit into a wall or if he get hit from somebody, but he right off, drive off. I don't know. That's what I'm hearing. So I don't know, honestly, how he died. Because by the time I get there, everything was done. Because we heard somebody got in the accident and we didn't know who it was. And I was just like, I, I felt bad. I was like, look at how that person get up this morning. And they ain't even went through most of the day and they died already. And when somebody, the same person come, the same person large, he came and told us that my brother died. There's regional and international news after this short break. Hi, my name is Christian Paul. I'm the country manager of BCIC here in Barbados. When the COVID vaccine first came out, I thought it was an interesting and a potentially successful way for us to navigate our way out of the pandemic and a return to some state of normalcy. I took the vaccine because I have a young family. I want to make sure that they are safe and protected. I have friends, extended family, and obviously I work here with colleagues, so I thought it was a good way to protect, to help protect them and to keep them safe, as well as myself. I would encourage others to take the vaccine because I know that you can still transmit the disease, even if you're vaccinated, but the chances of being severely ill or worse dying are significantly reduced. Let's roll up our sleeves and get back to living. To regional developments now, a policeman in Guyana is facing the possibility of being charged following a high-speed chase that claimed the lives of two young people. More from News Source Guyana. 
The policeman who was behind the steering wheel of that police vehicle, which was involved in a high-speed chase that ended in a fatal accident that claimed the lives of two youths, will face charges of causing death by dangerous driving. The Director of Public Prosecutions has advised that Police Officer Lawrence Carmichael faced the charges for the 2nd of February accident, which left Christopher Bangwendat and Sharita Passat dead. The DPP has also asked for further investigations to be conducted in the matter and for the file to be returned for additional advice by the 7th of March. It is possible that the DPP is seeking to institute additional charges in the matter. The accident occurred in the vicinity of the Mahaika Bridge. During its initial report on the accident, the police claimed that a car which was being driven by 21-year-old mechanic Christopher Bangwendat had avoided a police roadblock and was pursued by a police patrol vehicle. During the chase, which was captured in surveillance video in the area, the two vehicles could be seen driving at a fast rate. As the car approached the Mahaika Bridge, eyewitnesses said the police vehicle increased its speed and might have jammed the back of the car, sending it into the path of a truck in the opposite lane. The police vehicle also slammed into the same truck. The 21-year-old mechanic and his 16-year-old girlfriend both died on the spot. And finally, on the international front, UNICEF's executive director, Catherine Russell, has revealed that the situation for children caught up in the conflict in Ukraine grows worse by the minute. And she has appealed for a suspension of ongoing military operations, which she said would allow for humanitarian help. We are receiving reports of hospitals, schools, water and sanitation facilities and orphanages under fire. Explosive weapons in populated areas and explosive remnants of war are real and present dangers for children in Ukraine. Children have been killed, children have been wounded, and children are being profoundly traumatized by the violence all around them. We appeal for suspension of ongoing military operations in Ukraine. Such a suspension would allow for humanitarian help to reach children cut off after five days of intensive airstrikes and fierce ground fighting nationwide. It would also allow families in the worst affected areas to venture out to get food and water, to seek medical care and to leave in search of safety. We renew our call on all parties to protect civilians and civilian infrastructure and to abide by all legal and moral obligation to keep children out of the line of fire. We must protect all children in Ukraine now before it's too late. That's news. But for the very latest, visit us at www.barbadistoday.bb. You can also subscribe to our e-paper, email updates, or like us on Facebook, and sign up for our breaking news alerts via WhatsApp. We're also on Izumi Media in bus terminals, as well as screenplay at supermarkets and gas stations near you. And you can also hear us on Mix 96.9 FM and Capital Media HD 99.3 FM.